Hello everyone, today is Thursday, September 25th, 2014. Last week I said it was May. <laughs> it's been a little bumpy lately. Uh, but no, today it is, um, it is September, it is the 25th, and it is, of course, Thursday. And that means this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week, especially with the market being a developing situation, I know it's always developing. But today it seems like it's extra developing, so got a lot to cover. I'm going to get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. Nice uh, fluorescent green color. I know it's not good for me, but it um, gets me jacked up. All right, there's a disclaimer screen. Everybody here, I'm going to assume, knows you can lose money trading. If not, you can. Oh, good stuff. Best way for me to sum it up is all predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Hey, this is part of the show where I beg for a review of my book. I picked up one last week, so thank you very much. And the reason I do that is because there are some malignant people out there. Who review reviews? And I can't imagine being that malignant where you have nothing better to do in your life but go review other reviews. By that, I mean we never read the book, but they read reviews and review reviews. <laughs> imagine hanging around with that guy. Oh, my God. Somebody recently said, Dave, I'd like to hang out with you. You seem like you'd be a good guy to have a beer with. I was like, well, thank you. You're better than hanging out with that malignant guy. Anyway, this tiny Earl will bring you to uh, to Amazon where the reviews are. All right, what we talk about? Well, a lot of times I'll wake up early, earlier than normal, because I get up pretty damn early anyway. But um, this morning I was laying in bed, and I really got to thinking about um, good employees versus bad employees and trading psychology and some of the other things that I mentioned in today's column. So we're going to cover all those things. And... I just lay there, and it goes through my mind over and over again. Finally, I just woke up and started writing, and that's why it's a long column. Um, I do want to talk about doing the right thing, and that will make sense in just one minute. And it's, it's one of my, my speeches I've given. It kind of dovetails in with some of this other stuff. And um, the stupidest man in stupid town. That will make sense in a few minutes, too. All right. Um, If you read today's column, somebody emailed me and said, break the lithium in half. It's like, hey, I thought it was pretty good. But I digress. And in today's column, I was thinking about stocks being employees versus children. And I, I used to love stocks. Now I hate them. Doesn't mean that I don't still love the trade, that I don't like going on that treasure hunt to find that stock and buy that stock and hopefully profit off of that stock. It's just that my attitude towards stocks has completely changed. And I know it sounds a little negative, but it's almost like my trading has never been better since I've, I've taken on this negative aspect. So it's like I get a stock in a portfolio. He's there temporarily, okay? He's taking up space. And he better do something right, or I'm going to get rid of him. So you got to treat him as an employee. And I've talked about this before, but the gist of it is you got four employees. One guy's busting his ass, okay? He's carrying the entire workload pretty much on his shoulders. Are you going to fire him because you're thinking, well, tomorrow he can't keep working like that. He's just going to stop working and not care anymore. No, you keep him. You got three other guys sitting on their buttocks. Okay, what are you gonna do? You gonna keep those guys, thinking that oh well maybe tomorrow they'll start working again, or maybe I should hire three more bums. You know, it's like, it's like maybe I should invest more into these bums. No, you got to get rid of them. Okay, so you want to fire any employee that's not performing. Now, well, but Dave, you had the dead money report. Every other week, you're always talking about dead money, dead money, and don't get rid of stocks. 
Well, it's two different things. One is as long as a stock hasn't hit the stop, S-T-O-P, then you stay with it. Okay, so that means that it's like as long as the employee doesn't violate the company handbook, the rule book or whatever, then you keep that employee, okay, even if they're not performing as well as you want them to as long as they don't violate the cardinal rule. What's the cardinal rule? They hit the stop. Once they hit the stop, sorry, you're one and done, okay? Now, they might go down and flirt with the stop and maybe kind of kick it around a little bit and then and then start working. Well, that's okay, okay? You kind of give them a little warning when they're down there nicking the stop or kind of flirting around the stop. That's okay. But if they hit the stop and generally go through it, then you have to fire them. No questions asked, okay? And that's where it's kind of like I've learned to hate stocks. It's like if they're doing poorly and they hit the stop, then so what? Bam, you're out, okay? It took me a long term time to get to that point. So you have to be willing to kick them out. Now, you do want to keep any stock that's not violating company policy, like any stock that's not hitting the stop. So that's where the dead money again comes in. It's okay to have a stock kind of flatline for a little while. As long as that stop is not hit, let's say your stop's down here, that's okay. Maybe he's just taking a break, okay? Maybe he's on a coffee break before he decides to take off again. You have to be very antiseptic. Don't care about what they do. Don't care about their earnings. I mean, have a general idea of what sector they belong in. But even, even that isn't important if you... Really, 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 really liked setup. I didn't real. I knew Zen was a technology company, but I didn't realize exactly what kind of technology. That's a stock in the portfolio. We'll take a look at it in a minute. Somebody emailed me yesterday. Said they're in the cloud business. Okay, well, that's good. And um, okay, but I like the setup above and beyond anything. If if you like the setup. And you really have to be honest with yourself. Do you really, 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 really like that setup? And if you do, don't care about what industry they're in. Don't care about the subsector. Don't care about the overall market. And don't care. Uh, just don't care. <laughs> and as long as you really like the setup. Now, if anything, if it's not the best looking setup that you've ever seen, then, of course, then you want to dig a little further. Ideally, you want the sector to match, the subsector to match, and more importantly, you want the subsector to match because the overall sector could be a little different, um, could trade a little differently than the, than the subsector itself. Uh, so the subsector, I often get this question, the subsector is more important than the sector when it comes to analyzing the stock. And ideally, you want the market to be going in the same direction. Like I say, sometimes two out of three ain't bad. You might have the sector at the stock, or I'm sorry, the subsector of the stock going in the same direction, and the market might be a little iffy, or one of those other two might be a little iffy. But um, if you really, really like it, then one out of three ain't bad, okay? So as a general statement, other than knowing what sector they're in, as a general statement, don't really care about what they do. Don't care about their earnings. I'm going to kind of pick that apart in a minute, so we'll come back to that. And you have to view stocks as a vehicle, you know, it's like, let's say you get on a bus or a train, and as long as it gets you from point A to point B safely and comfortably, do you really care about the bus? And it's like, no, it's like you shouldn't care about the stock. It should be very antiseptic. Now, it's, it's easy for me to be antiseptic because once you get enough trades under your belt, it won't really matter. Yeah, you still get bummed out when you go through drawdowns, and it still sucks, to put it mildly, it's good that I've, I've joined these professional organizations, one in particular, the American Association of Perfect Professional Technical Analysts, because I'm able to rub elbows with some of these guys many of you have heard of. And it's good to see, not that it's Friday, but it's, it's kind of like sometimes misery loves company. 
it's good to see that, yeah, these guys have drawdowns too. And, yeah, it's like, what's their answer? Well, it just sucks. You just, you just deal with it. And you have to reach that antiseptic point where you just say, well, it comes to the territory. It's one of those things. Um, for me, it's easy to be antiseptic. It's especially true with IPOs because I know most IPOs are, pardon my French, bullshit, okay? <laughs> They're not going to materialize, okay? That doesn't mean you can't make money in them, okay? I had a long rant about sardines when we did the IPO course. You just have to treat it as something that you trade and you, not, you don't eat. You don't keep it, okay? So for me, it's especially easy in IPOs. Um, I had one ran up 100% not too long ago. I was, I was happy with it, but it, what, I didn't fall in love with it. I said, well, it is what it is. Maybe it'll go up 2%, maybe 200%, maybe it won't. So I'll put a stop in just in case. Got stopped out. So what? Better to have loved and lost a little bit of that open profit than to never have loved at all. Now, why is it hard to do the right thing? And more importantly, how to do the right thing? Well, you have to admit failure. And I've said this story a few times because it's fairly recent. I'll say it again. I like to go on fairly long walks. Well, if it's just me by myself, it's, the walk's not quite as long. Um, but if my wife is with me, she's pretty um, pretty good about exercising and making me move my fat arse around. Uh, they're much longer. But anyway, sometimes I'll go on, on a fairly long walk by myself. And it's great to get a little thinking in during that time. And sometimes I actually, not that I'm always this goal-oriented, but Sometimes before I leave the house, I think, what am I going to think about while I'm walking? What, what, uh, what world problem am I going to solve? And I left the house a few months back in the middle of the day, just take a break, and said, you know, I'm going to think about why people refuse to plan their trades. And the answer came to me pretty quick. And the answer is, as soon as you make a plan, you immediately... The second you make that plan, you have admitted, you have immediately admitted that you might fail, okay? Now, who wants to, who wants to admit that, 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 that there's a chance, <laughs> my dude's kicking in, that there's a chance you're going to fail? None of us, but there is a chance that you will fail. So you have to plan that trade, and part of that plan is, part of the plan is you have to have a protective stop. Where are you going to get out if you are wrong? I know it's cliche, but you've got to plan that trade, and then you've got to trade that plan. So the answer that I came to is that no one wants to admit the potential for failure. But in this business, you have to embrace it, and you have to, I don't want to say expect it because that's, that's going to be a little too negative. You don't want to expect it on every trade, but you want to expect that there's always a possibility. Um, I've gotten into some really great trades, and I know from day one that it was going to be a great trade. But I tend to forget about those that I think are going to be absolutely fantastic and just don't work out. We tend to have a bit of a, a bias, obviously, towards the positive. And that's a good thing. You don't want to be malignant and spend your whole day writing reviews on book reviews, right? You want to be positive. But you do have to be realistic and know that there is always a chance of failure. Now, it took me a while to do this, and I read Douglas many years ago, and he's helped me. Um, I don't know if I met him in person or not. I've, I've talked to him on the phone once. I forget why. He may have called me, but I forget why we talked. But his first book, The Disciplined Trader, is pretty darn good. And uh, a lot of people, I find people who are a little bit newer to trading, they like his second book better. But um, I just I like the first book because that's probably when I was struggling the most. It probably would help me out the most. Um, and it's called The Disciplined Trader, Developing Winning Attitudes by Douglas. You can get it off my website. Uh, in the list of books. Go to the list of books, and um, those are some of my other books I would recommend you read. And one thing that he talked about in there is that sometimes you have to view things as happening and not as happening 
to you. And that's where the, the Tyson quote comes to mind. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. And that's true. And, and I'm not a huge sports fan, so, a fan although I watch the Saints. But um, it's pretty easy to be an armchair quarterback. You've got a big linebacker running at you. Uh, things are a little bit differently, okay? So it's a much different situation. And like Tyson said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Well, you're going to get punched in the face sometimes, so you're going to have to brace for that. So you have to figure out a way, and I think Douglas talked about it being a movie, like watching a movie. You get caught up in a movie, but deep down inside you know that it's not you're not really getting shot at okay <laughs> but you have to kind of pretend you're watching a movie it's 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 whatever game works for you it kind of reminds me of a friend of mine who was um a very successful broker in his prior life and everybody made fun of him in the office but each day he would come in dressed as as a different persona and some days he'd come in with a cowboy hat and cowboy boots and spurs or whatever and it's like it was his way of of getting through the I guess the cold calls or whatever he he was able to take on this persona and and do these things it was his sort of game of getting through the day and the way he handled things and the way he did things and he became successful doing it now it's kind of a quirky quirky tangent but you kinda of get the idea it's like when this stuff is happening you have to see it as happening and not happening to you. And, I, and, and your, your phraseology, if that's a word, the way you phrase things can really help quite a bit. Okay, And it's almost like a game. It's like when you go to drop that F-bomb, you know, instead, of, instead of dropping the F-bomb, say, oh, that's interesting. You know, Or if you do... Um, Drop the f bomb. You know, say it with a British accent or something, because everything sounds so much more proper with a British accent. Now I know I'm being kind of a little strange here, but you get the idea. If you could learn to just kind of look at it and say, "Oh, that's interesting," um, you know, if things are going well, I kind of like, "Oh, look at you, you good little stock," and "Oh, look at you, you bad little stock, you naughty little stock." If you hit that stop, I'm going to kick your buttocks out of the portfolio. Now it's kind of I'm kind of being a little silly and out there on you, but you get the idea. If you can do whatever it takes for you to do the right thing, your life is going to be a lot easier. And if you can figure out what game to play, whether it's kind of like watching a movie, your phraseology like, "Oh, that's interesting," or oh, "Look at this piece of crap." I think I might have to get rid of it. Then you'll do your life will get a lot easier. What would Ron Popeil do? Ron Popeil did uh, a Ron Popeil had a Showtime Rotisserie 2000 grill, and in the advertorial he said you need to set it and forget it. Okay, so what would Ron Popeil do? As long as you have a stop in place, there's nothing to do. Let me rephrase that. Or I should say, let me repeat that. As long as you have a stop in place, there's nothing to do. Okay? Now, you do have to take a little action sometimes, and this is a good thing, if that stock is approaching that initial profit target. You do have to take a little action there. And if the stock's moving in your favor, you do have to occasionally bump that stop up. But for the most part, there's not much to do with your open portfolio other than let it let it work. And if something gets stopped out, it gets stopped out. Something takes, hits a profit target, you take the partial profit. And if something continues to move in your favor, you continue to trail that stop. Now, I know it's easier said than done. But if you could just play a game with yourself or, or you know, do a game, do a silly game with yourself where you say, okay, the next five trades, I'm going to do the right thing. Um, I'll give you one of the games I play, and, and, and part of it is, 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 has a reality to it. I pretend on everything I do that everyone is watching over my shoulder, and I have to do the right thing. It's kind of like when um, the, other, you know, the other day, it was about six years ago, but quite a while back, 
Um, I had some trades on. I wasn't sure what to do. And my wife was in my office, and she goes, what's up? I said, well, it's a good problem to have, but I have these trades on. They're doing well. I'm not sure what to do. She goes, well, what would Dave Landry do? And it's, I kind of growled at her a little bit, but she's right, you know. It's like if I'm going to put myself out there as being this quote-unquote expert or guru, I hate the word guru, but you know the point. You get my point. Then I'm going to have to do the right thing, and that's one advantage that I have by having this educational business because – you know, quite frankly, it's self-serving. It, it it forces me to do the right thing. So even if there's nobody looking over your shoulder, pretend that someone is, okay? Now, I know a lot of traders who trade. They're not traders. They're lawyers and doctors and automatic transmission mechanics, and they're making a good living doing what they're doing, and they're frittering away money in their trading account, and they consistently lose money. And they lose money because they're sweeping it under the rug. They don't need that money to live on. They don't need to take that money out. That money is not going to going to change their lifestyle. At least they're not trading at a size that, that would change their lifestyle. But they sweep it under the rug, and no one knows about it other than them. And as long as they can continue to do that, they're going to continue to do the wrong, the wrong thing. Okay. But if they had to report what they were doing to someone, then that someone would likely say, well, why do you just keep losing money? Why do you keep holding on to these winners? So it's like if you could play as part of your game, pretend that someone's looking over your shoulder, then you'd do a lot better. Or maybe find maybe find a friend who also trades, and you guys compare trades. And then, you know, with guys, it's kind of easy because we kind of like to, <laughs> you know, bust each other's chops, so to speak. But find somebody that's going to bust your chops. Find, you don't want to find someone that's going to, that's going to console you and, and pet your little head and make you think everything's going to be all right. You want to find somebody to kick you in the butt when you're doing the wrong thing. If you want to pay me a lot of money, I'll do that for you. I'd be happy to kick you in the butt. Uh, learn to call versus collect. We're not stock collectors, okay? We're stock traders. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't have a position on for two or three years. That's fine. That's, that's the ultimate goal. That's what we want to do. But nine out of ten times... A position is not going to last that long. You will get stopped out within a few weeks or a few months, okay? So your job is to call out those stocks as they get stopped out and then find a new one or new ones to put in their place, if any. As I wrote in the column today, there might be times where you don't want any new employees. Maybe you just want to relax a little bit and not have to worry about any employees okay and that's fine and the market will off to dictate that if you can't find any setups and there's nothing to do um hate stocks unless they're freaking awesome you know maybe i was a little too negative about hating stocks this morning but you need to love your winners and hate your losers and but you don't want to carry that hatred too long you want to just get rid of that losing stock you don't want to come in day after day after day and watch that stock go down 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 if if a stock is going down, it's going down maybe for a reason, and maybe it's going to keep going down. If it keeps going down, then it's a trend. And every day that you come in that you fail to exit that losing stock, it's just going to stress you out more and more and more. And like I wrote in today's column, then it becomes something bigger than that. Even if you're one of those aforementioned guys who's sweeping it under the rug, sweeping those losses under the rug, well, guess what? That negativity is going to creep into your life, okay? And you're going to maybe not be as nice as you should to your spouse or your children or your friends or coworkers or whatever the case may be. So I don't want to let freshman psychology rear its ugly head too much today. Ha ha, too late, I know. But keep in mind that if you're not following that plan, it, it's going to creep into the rest of your life. We all have drawdowns. We all have trades that don't work. That part sucks. Don't get me wrong, okay? But that's when you learn to start being super, super selective, and you might end up flat for a while while waiting for the next trend, and that's perfectly okay. And that's, that's hard for a lot of people to, number one, not do anything when there's nothing to do, and number two, be patient and wait for that next trend to come along. Now, Sometimes in between trends, you get one or two, you take a stab out here and there. If you really, really like the setup, then by all means take it. But if the market's choppy, sector's choppy, then 
as a general statement, you probably want to be out of the market, which is hard for many. You didn't get paid. You didn't become successful in life by, by not doing anything, right? You're a doctor. You're treating patients. You're a lawyer. You're defending clients. <laughs> it's like a lawyer for the body's a criminal lawyer. You know, it's like uh, <laughs> someone said, uh, and, and, uh, and let's hope that um, John gets a lot of good guys to defend. And, uh, and he told me, he goes, hey, I don't make anybody off good guys. You know, it's like, oh, okay, well, <laughs> did he say that out loud, really? <laughs> um, anyway, I digress. So be an optimist in life. You know, it's like I was going to be a pessimist, but I figured it wouldn't work out, all right? But, you know, you, you hate being around these reviewers of the reviews. You hate being around these malignant people. Nobody wants to be around them. But you need to be a bit of a pessimist in your portfolio, okay? You need to be more concerned about what can go wrong than what could go right. But guess what? What could go wrong will take care of itself as long as you honor your stop. Easier said than done. <laughs> it's easier said than done. But it's like I said when I hate stocks, I get mad when a stock goes down, okay? I can't wait to kick it out of the portfolio. Sometimes it's like I find myself saying, I wish you would just hit the stop so I could get rid of you, drop that final F-bomb, you know, and be done with you. Sometimes I actually feel that way. So you have to have that, and I, I guess I'm coming from too much of a negative slant on this. I need to figure out a way to make it more positive. Like Zig Ziglar once, that little boy said he had a, he said, Dad, I, um, <laughs> he, said, he said, Dad, I think I, um, I flunked that math, math test. And the dad says, you got to be more positive. And the kid says, well, I'm positive I flunked that math test. But I digress. But if things aren't working out with the stock and it hits the stop and it hits the stop, then you got to get out. And like I said, if something's not working in my portfolio, I don't micromanage myself out of the position. Okay, I don't see it as dead money, but especially if it's at a loss, as soon as it hits that stop, there is a relief with me because I kicked it out of the portfolio. And, you know, that's another thing that Douglas said that, that really, really drove the point home with me. And I have his tapes back from, I don't know if you guys, any of you guys here remember the TAG conference. There was a gentleman, uh, his name escapes me at this second. I've, I've, I've seen him speak before, but... Um, Oh, gosh, what's his name? I can't think of it. But anyway, he's a nice, nice gentleman. He started the TAG conferences, which I think got bought out by Traders Expo. And I was um, – they used to have uh, – uh, because he's from New Orleans, they actually had conferences down here in New Orleans. The reason I say that is for some reason there's not a whole lot of trading conferences down here. Maybe I should change that. Maybe I should have Big Dave's trading conference. We'll, uh, we'll eat some crawfish, drink some beer, go to Bourbon Street, and then we'll – well, uh, we might learn something in the process. Anyway, um, he started the, the um, tag conferences, and uh, way back then, I've got a, I had some tapes from the conference. I used to sell cassette tapes. Uh, most of you would hear. Now that I'm getting a little older, I realize how young most of you are. Cassette tape is this little, it, it's tape, and it actually has a tape in it, a magnetic tape that records things, and you slide them into a little slot. And it reads the tape and it plays the, the audio. I know it's it's crazy to talk about these <laughs> archaic type of things. Anyway, on one of his tapes, he said that, and I, and I say this almost every week, it's just about one of the most favorite things ever. And I think it really drove the point home with me. A, a, a bad salesman makes a few calls, and then he gets bummed out when not, none of those calls pan out. And he says... The heck with this. I'm going to go drink my lunch, okay? A good salesman makes a few calls. It gets rejected and says, okay, let me go grab a cup of coffee. Goes get a cup of coffee, maybe a Mountain Dew. And then he takes a deep breath, gets this little coffee in him, and he says, all right, I got all those bad calls out the way. Now, I'm going to get some good calls. It's like if anybody would buy, you know, golf about once a year, somebody would buy my golf clubs. I, I got all those bad shots out the way, right? So you should have only good shots left. But seriously, that's that's how a good salesman works. It's like the aforementioned guy that was in the cow, you know, would wear a different suit every day or a cowboy suit. Some days he's a businessman, some days a cowboy. 
you know, that was his way of just keeping positive and knowing that, chipping away at that those sales, knowing that if you get enough rejections, then all that's left are positive expectations. So in trading, even though I'm getting stopped out sometimes, even though I'm going through a drawdown, I know it's like, okay, well, let's just get, okay, get out. Get out of my portfolio. You're gone. You're done. You're done. I know I'm getting closer and closer to some winners when that happens, okay? So be an optimist in life, but a pessimist with your portfolio. What's an A-track? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny. You remember the A-tracks? It's like if you listen to the song, you'd be jamming along with the song, and then all of a sudden it would change tracks in the middle of the song. And, and we accepted that, that we knew that we could be doing a little air guitar or air drums or whatever, sing along, and then click, click, it, it would change tracks. And then the song would continue. We'd go right back to where we were. Many times we wouldn't even uh, miss a beat. <laughs> uh, Jonathan, my audio is working fine on this end. Uh, some, a squirrel may have gotten his nuts caught in the wires between uh, me and you. So sometimes that happens. Jonathan, you come to the conference? All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Maybe you guys could even, um, invis maybe we could do, a, do it in my studio here. I got a, I just built a video studio, as uh, some of you might know. All right, let's uh, talk about doing the right thing. And, 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 you know, sometimes I get a little philosophical on you guys, and I know that, but I think I have to. And sometimes ebb and flow can control your portfolio, okay? So we have a stop in place, okay? It stops at 20 on this one. And you know what I'm going to do if the stop gets hit? I'm going to exit that position, okay? I can promise you I'm going to do that. You know why? Because... I kind of feel like you're looking over my shoulder. In fact, now you know where my stop is. And if you ask me tomorrow when that stock's trading, if that stock's trading at 19, ooh, hold on when the Freudian slip. Hey, Dave, you still in Zen? I'm like, yeah. And it's like, well, why are you still in Zen? Well, I'm going to get out. Where am I going to get out? I'm going to get out when it hits 20. Now, if it comes down and goes, gives 20 a little kiss, and it takes off, it goes to 30, I'm going to stay with it, okay? So check back often. But ebb and flow control in the portfolio. We've got um, we've got a losing trade in here right now. So what do we do with it? Well, if it hits that stop, we get out. Happens to be Micron, which is going to dovetail into our next segment here. So by letting the ebb and flow control your portfolio, you're able to ride out the winners and you weed out the losers. How do you weed out the losers? I'm glad you asked. You have a stop. If it hits a stop, you exit. Have I said that yet today? Now, take a look at RAD. RAD went sideways forever. It was dead money. Well, guess what? Just made a big move recently. What was that big move on? Earnings, okay? It sold off nicely in the earnings. By the way, somebody emailed me. This is where we're going to get into the earnings in just one second, but... This is what led to this conversation, this conversation I'm getting ready to have here. Someone emailed me, hey, Dave, uh, if you reports tomorrow, what are you going to do? I'm not going to do anything. Okay? Well, wait a minute. Let me check my portfolio. Oh, I know what I'm going to do. If it hits 20, if it hits uh, 34, I'm going to get out. That's what I'm going to do. Okay? So anyway, somebody emailed me, hey, Dave, uh, earning, uh, MU reports the bar. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> Here I was. Every time I try to avoid the news, they draw me right back in. So I do get a little no news through osmosis. And by accident, eh, not so much accident, I did click on a little clip from CNBC. And during that clip, they had the, uh, what's your best stock idea? And like in the last second, the guy hollered in, buy MU into the earnings. And I'm like, what a stupid effing strategy. That is the stupidest thing in stupid town. I wish I knew who said it so I could call him out as being the stupidest person in stupid town. I'm not scared. I, you know, <laughs> I'm getting old and cranky. Why would you do that? Why would you buy a stock into earnings if that's your strategy? Why would that be your strategy? But, Dave, you just said hold the stock. Yes, because that's my strategy. 
My strategy is to get into stock and stay with it until I'm profitable and get stopped out or until I'm at a loss and get stopped out. That's my plan. My plan is not to willy-nilly buy a stock before earnings because I think the earnings may be good. That is stupid. That is the most stupidest thing you could do. It's stupid town. Because you're betting, you're making a bet that the earnings are going to be good. Okay? Well, what if you write on that bet? Well, yeah, that stock will go up, right, Dave? No. No. The stock might go down. We talked about RAD a minute ago going up on earnings. RAD went up on good earnings. RAD went up on some of the best earnings they've ever had. It's the reaction to the news and not the news itself. So, Tim Slater, thank you, Michael. I couldn't think of that forever. Michael, you've been around for a while. Have you gone to any of those? Uh, yeah, it used to be CompuTrack. It was CompuTrack tag. I think they just started calling it a tag. I've got some notebooks around here. With, I think I'm out of gate. My daughter came uh, in the office the other night and said, uh, Dad, I need a, a, a folder. I think I took the papers out and gave her the uh, CompuTrack folder. Yeah, it was computer Tim Slater. Nice, nice guy. Super nice guy. Um, he's 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 the one who started all these um, educational uh, uh, webinars or seminars. They weren't webinars back then. So anyway, you know, this is the stupidest thing. A stupid town. Now, if this is your strategy, if you always buy stocks right before the earnings, if that's how you want to trade, that's fine. Do what you want. But this guy is like buy MU into the earnings, and that's nothing more than gambling. You're gambling on the out, you're gambling on two things. Well, it's really just one thing. You're gambling on the reaction to the earnings, okay? That's my point is like, what's his point? The earnings are going to be good? Well, so what if they're good? What if the public wanted even better earnings, okay? You got some tapes? That's, that's awesome. All right, so let's talk about news. Not that I haven't talked about it enough. All right, I just grabbed some... Uh, last minute slides here and this is CLDX and how often do earnings come out every three months here's one month here's two months here's three months four months four and a half months okay so and then I don't know how long we stayed this position this is not the full position but it stopped out I don't know somewhere here somewhere maybe not quite so high but you get the idea so during that let's say probably five months period there was at least one earnings announcement in this stock, okay? So had you gotten out ahead of those earnings, you would have missed a really, really nice trend, okay? SunPower, I've kind of beat this one to death, okay? But the trigger was back in December of 2013, okay? That's almost... That's almost a year ago, almost. Okay, we're now into fall 2014. So let's say it's a little bit less than a year. Let's say it's nine, eh, it's a little more than nine months, maybe 10 months. All right, what's 10 divided by three? Oh, three point something, right? 3.333 something. So there was 3.33 earnings announcements during that period. If you would have gotten out on the first one, before the first one, which maybe I'm guessing was right here, I don't know, you would have missed all of that, okay? So if you're going to be a trend follower, then you don't, um, then you stick with the stock, okay? Until when? Until you stopped out. I wish we had, I wish you guys were here in person, and then I could say, we could do like Ron Popeil said it, and then I point to you, and you say, Ed, forget it. And I'll say, what do you, you stay with the trend until, and then you guys say, you're stopped out, okay? Avoid chasing your own tail. Now, I got a little nasty gram the other day telling me I'm just too caught up in the noise, and uh, you know me, I kind of, um, I'll kind of uh, beat the dead horse on something and, and, and kind of milk it for all it's worth, <laughs> and I've been writing a lot about that. But trading markets, I should say, like life, can only be taken one day at a time. Now, it's easier said than done. I don't. <laughs> I worry about a lot of things, trust me, okay? But the reality is 
If you just take days, one day, take life one day at a time, your life becomes a lot easier. If you take markets one day at a time, your life becomes a lot easier. Each day brings a new clue. It's either going to be a positive event, a negative event, and I guess it could also be eh, kind of neutral. Maybe the market went flat some days, okay? But even if it is flat, you do have another piece of information. And that piece of information might be that the market has lost some momentum from its prior trend. So with each clue, if you have more negative than positive events, it's possible cause for concern. Two days ago, we had a pretty negative market. Okay? I wrote in my column, you know, I made the, I made the point that it was a negative day. But it doesn't necessarily mean that somebody's going to ring the bell or that's the bell being rung. Okay, well, now, maybe it was. Who knows? We'll see. And then yesterday was a positive day. So that sort of canceled out the prior day. But there's still some concerns out there. Then, bam, today we're going to put a down day. Okay, so now you got another negative event. So I know it's, I know it's kind of like, duh. But you start stringing together these negative events. Then guess what? You might be be getting a downtrend. If you string together positive events, even more positive than negative events, then maybe it's cause to celebrate. Maybe we could celebrate an uptrend, okay? So if the S&P starts hitting brand new highs and then the Russell joins in and the NASDAQ joins in, we could all kiss each other, high five, and have a party, right? Now, the one thing in between is sometimes you get a bad day, a good day, a bad day, and maybe the market is just choppy. Okay, so Tuesday was bad, Wednesday was good, Thursday was bad. If tomorrow the market goes straight up and negate, negates all that, then maybe it's just choppy. Maybe it's just what we call in the business railroad tracks. And they call them railroad tracks because you got a down day, an up day. I guess it would be a down day like this. Up day, down day, up day, okay? And then it sort of looks like railroad tracks just by going sideways. Um. Now, sometimes one bad day is just one bad day. It's often a process and not an event. I didn't have time to look it up, but as I would say, quite a bit. Uh, I, I like Greg Morse's uh, new book. He's a beer drinking friend of mine, so uh, I'm obviously a little biased. Um, I don't get any compensation for, miss, for mentioning it unless you go to my website and click on, the, um, click on his book and buy it, and I'll get a couple of bucks. But there's a plethora of knowledge in that book, and I'm more interested. I'm not so much interested in the indicators and his market analysis and such, which he lays out. I'm more interested in the words of wisdom and the things that he has to say in his book. And I couldn't dig it out quick enough. I need to take some more notes and, um, and find it. But he talked about that tops aren't necessarily this one big day and then that's, bam, it's topped, okay? Uh, tops are usually more of a process than an event. It just seems like a market implodes overnight. But it's fascinating because I've done a tremendous amount of research over the years. And one thing that I've learned is that things begin to deteriorate long before a market begins to sell off hard. So it is often more of a process and not an event. So you might be thinking, hey, Dave, what about 1987? All right, let's take a look at 1987. You can see the Dow Jones was going about its little merry way. I use the Dow Jones because that's a, that was the big deal at the time when the market crash. It's kind of going about its merry way. Made a brand new all-time high here. Pull back a tiny bit, and then it makes a marginal new high here. Still a new high, but a new high nonetheless. Then it begins to sell off a little bit, kind of pops up a little bit, sell off a little bit, pop up a little bit, okay? So it's kind of hanging in there, but let's take a look at what happened on a net-net basis. Well, here in August, it was here, and now here in October, it was here, okay? So if anything, you can draw a line Between those two points, I hope I hit mute quick enough. That Mountain Dew just kind of jumped up on me. <laughs> uh, and you can see that it's at the least it's going sideways. Well, then what happens is it begins going down, okay? Now, I 
don't know about you, but I can almost guarantee you if I'm a trend follower and I've got some positions on that I accumulated way back here while the market was going up, and this market starts going down either here or here, okay, and certainly here, I could all but guarantee you that I would be stopped out of every position that I owned. Now, I wasn't trading in 87. I started shortly thereafter. But I can tell you that based on my system today, okay, in perfect hindsight, I can almost guarantee you I would have gotten stopped out. Okay, and, and in, as far as evidence of that is, I've gotten stopped out on some much minor spills, got it cleaned out of all my longs, on some much minor spills over the last few years. So I know pretty much for a fact, there's no guarantees obviously, but pretty much for a fact that when that market starts behaving like that as a trend follower, I'm going to get stopped out probably long before, and hopefully long before, but something begins to materialize. And at that juncture too, if all you did was say, okay, not that there's anything magical about it, but this is a 10-day moving average. Here's a 20-day exponential moving average. Here's a 30-day exponential moving average. What are we observing here? The 10 simple is greater than the 20 exponential is greater than the 30 exponential, okay? So what are we observing here? It's like, well, the 10 crossed over, crossed below, and then the 30 crossed below. Now, they kind of meandered a little bit here, okay? And they kind of came up and kissed each other, but then they rolled right back over. Well, at this juncture here, we could see that the 10 is below the 20 is below the 30. And over the next day, it's even more obvious, okay, that the trend may have turned based on the fact that the moving averages have turned. Now, the moving averages are going to be a little slow to catch up, but they've caught up with the market, believe it or not, before what? Before it crashed, okay? So it's 1987. Well, fine. What about 1929? All right. What about 1929? Okay. Well, you can see the market made all-time highs, and it had a pretty serious sell-off. Not the end of the world. Just a normal type of correction. In fact, go back to June of 29. You're just kind of back where you were back in June. But shorter term, you can see a bit of a downtrend. But what also do you have? You have a bow tie off of all-time highs. Okay. Not every bow tie off of all-time highs is going to turn into the mother of all tops. But every top is going to have a bow tie or some other emerging trend pattern, such as a first thrust or a gatekeeper or one of these other patterns. So very important, or I should say it pays to pay attention when that occurs. So even in 1929 and 1987, which seemed like the biggest crashes of the market, the market didn't just crash, it just it just kind of slowly rolled over. What about the flash crash? Well, the flash crash would have knocked you out of most of your trades, and the market did bottom out, but then it went right back up, okay? So things can happen. But the flash crash did turn into a major top. We're talking about major secular tops in the market where the market had significant sell-offs thereafter, okay? All right, questions are coming in. I had CLT picked for an entry at 2440 based on the pullback, but passed. Curious your entry at 25. I understand it's an IPO webinar related, and you cannot talk about it. Yeah, I can talk about it um, because that was really set up as, a, as sort of a core methodology type of setup. Okay, the question is, uh, this gentleman was saying he was going to get it here, and I uh, put an entry up here. And all I'm doing is I wanted to, just in case this market rallied up and then came right back in, I wanted to give that position a lot of wiggle room, okay? Now, I did just kind of go up and barely touch that entry, but it's still an entry nonetheless, okay? So that's why. I was giving it room, okay? That's all it was. But, John, you can get, get the course, and then you'll, you'll have the course. I'm amazed. People put all this money into the market, and they buy IPOs. Dave, hey, what to do with Alibaba? I'm, I'm going to buy 100 shares at 10, you know, spend $10,000. Well, before you spend ten thousand dollars, spend four hundred dollars and get a webinar, get a course on IPOs. Okay, and I'll tell you what to do in there, 
and, and you would have avoided it. One reason in the past because I'm leery of a buy stop and I'm not in front of the computer when they trigger. Yeah, but in that particular case, John, you have pretty good uh, volume on that stock. Sometimes something bad can happen, but uh, you have pretty good volume on it. Okay, I have missed several winners due to this. Uh, well, okay, why not set an alarm? He's John saying that he's at a job and he's, uh, of course, if you're a surgeon cutting on people, maybe you shouldn't do this. Um, Anyway, I, I was going to tell some stories that I should. So <laughs> maybe that's that's for maybe if we do have a conference in New Orleans while we have a beer after a long day of talking, um, well, some of these stories will come up about what these uh, doctors are doing and should not be doing while they're be doctoring. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, unless you're cutting on someone or doing something else that's vitally important at that moment, uh, you could set a alarm on your smartphone. I'm guessing everybody has a smartphone because I have one now. I went. Uh, I tried to avoid a phone forever, and my wife finally made me get one. So um, I've got a smartphone. Probably the last person on earth to get one. So I'm assuming everybody else has one. Um, so set an alarm on your smartphone for when the stop might be getting close. And then, I'm sorry, the entry might be getting close. And if you have to do something, then do something. Um, I've had pretty good luck with, with buy stops. But I hear you, um, you know, because I'm here most of the time anyway, if it's something that's a more volatile stock or something like an IPO, maybe I'll actually uh, be a little bit more hands-on on getting in that position. The only problem with that is if you have a buy stop in place, you get triggered in, you get triggered in. If you don't have a buy stop in place, then what happens is it opens you up for, for more decision-making, okay? So I would say if you do have that, that pesky little day job getting in the way of your trading, then go ahead and use that buy stop, provided you've got ample volume on the stock, knowing that you're going to get burnt on occasion, but also know that you're going to catch the mother of all winners. You're going to get that Zen trade, that aforementioned Zen trade that takes off and goes up. Maybe that CLDX that goes up 200%. That buy stop is going to get you into those trades whereas you may have missed them. So a few, you know, one big winner pays for it all, like we, we talked about last week, okay? I have missed several winners. There you go, due to this. Then I drop F-bombs and am more prone to jumping into a losing trade, fearing that I will miss another, that my confidence is whacked. Well, I preach over and over. I mean, that's, what, that's, that's where do the right thing comes from that I talked about earlier. I wrote an article for Traders Magazine. Oh, I have one out this month, by the way, if you want to check it out. Uh, see my news today's newsletter for a link to that, and I'll put it on my website uh, later today. But I did an article for Traders. It's called Doing the Right Thing, okay? And it's like we know we shouldn't be doing this, but we do it anyway. So it's like stop doing that, okay? <laughs> and that's that's the best advice I could give you. So John just said – uh, you know, do this, and then I do this, and then I do this, and then I, then I get mad, and then I do this, and then it just gets worse. Well, John knows exactly what he's doing wrong. So the best person to fix John is who? John. Okay. Hey, I might write that down. <laughs> I will be a client soon, I promise. Well, thank you. Howard, hey, Dave, today's rant, especially profound. Thank you, Howard. Okay. Let me just get through a few of these. Um, there's just as thick as the rest of us, folks. Dave, I like the psychology stuff. It's very honest. Should it make smart listeners trust you more? Well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, somebody told me I was being crazy out there. Good morning. Absolutely great article. Frenchie, thank you so much. You made my day. I mean, yeah, my first feedback on it was break the lithium in half. It's like, what the hell is that supposed to be, you know? I'm the smart ass around here. I'm the guy who tells people to break the Prozac in half. You can't. Wait a minute. What's up with that? Okay, uh, Bill. We'll get to that. We'll get to that in just one second. Let me get through these announcements. Um, I don't have the link here, but if you go to YouTube and Google uh, setting up your office and computers for trading, and throw in Dave Landry, you're going to get a video that I did um, for YouTube. So check that out if you get a chance. Um, I'm I'm really proud of it. I mean, I just built a studio in my office, and I got asked to do some. The, the genesis of that, not that you care, but the genesis of that is um, I recently just had a friend from France visit, um, and he's a trader. And um, I have another friend who's a trader in Italy, 
and I'll be going to Italy uh, in March to do a, a seminar. And he asked me, the Italian asked me to do a um, a video, and then the Frenchman was giving me some coaching on videos, and he didn't like my currency wall. I've got a wall full of currencies, and he didn't like that as a backdrop. So I got to thinking, well, maybe I'll put up a backdrop, and then before he knew it, I bought a green screen, and then before you knew it, I bought six lights and two cameras, and it just or three cameras actually, and it just kind of snowballed from there. And now I turned the kitchen of my office into a full-blown studio, so it's pretty cool. I, I'm a nerd, but um, check out the video. I'm pretty excited about it. Give me a little feedback. Now keep in mind that this is my first production, and it needs a lot of work, and I realize that. But um, check out the YouTube and get a chance. Please like it, and uh, just put a comment like, "Hey, I like it." you know cool video whatever if you don't like it if you one thing on uh, I learned that if you hit like twice on YouTube it turns it's like the two positive somehow become a negative it turns to a don't like so if you don't like it hit like twice on YouTube okay okay I like the video James well like it on like it on uh, YouTube too okay uh, so check out that video if you get a chance pretty proud of it uh, my store is open for business, so check out the store on my website. It's uh, it's on the home page. And um, as I say each week, I've got volume one ready of these weekend charts. If you enjoy my rants, if you enjoy my teachings, then you could get um, up to 200 hours of, well, hours, let's see, 400. Oh, I forget how many hours it is, but each each year is 40 hours. No, no, each year is 50 hours approximately. And uh, somebody asked me for 20, 2011. I didn't realize I had them all. I dug them up, and I have them all consolidated. So if you want 2011, uh, you could get any other year and just say, Dave, I want 2011. So we got 2011, 2012, 2013, and half of 2014. So what is that? That's 150 plus, let's say, 20. So it's like 170-something hours of this. I, I can't imagine that you would um, want to operate heavy machinery after all that. But I think that there is something to be learned in these um, things. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing them, right? Anyway, check them out. Uh, I'm not going to go through all this. I think everybody here knows they have a trading service. Visit the store. Check it out. Okay. Um, I find standing very good for my thinking. Yeah, I was talking about uh, I'm standing now. I, I As part of the year, um, even if you don't want to – know about setting up a bunch of monitors for your trading um, I did the second half of that video I did was on ergonomics now keep in mind I'm not an ergonomics specialist but I can tell you that one I had health issues and two 95 percent of those health issues have gone away since I set it up set up my office properly properly I'm also feeling a hell of a lot better since I bought a stand-up desk now stand-up desk Quite frankly, they're not cheap, but it's an investment in your life. I was kind of half joking when I said watch the video because it might save your life, but I think it, I think it could help. Okay, I mean I've got like fluid in my legs and stuff, so from sitting down so much. So now it's like I, I try to stand as much as I can during the day. So watch the watch the part of the video about the ergonomics because these computers are going to ruin our lives sitting in front of these computers all day like we do. Uh, and that's regardless of, pretty much regardless of, uh, irregardless, I guess, of w whatever business you're in. Anyway, all right. I heard or read you recommended a s suitable or optimal velocity 50-day range for stock selection, but I don't capture it. Can you repeat it sometime today? Um, you're talking about uh, historical volatility. Um, historical volatility is a statistical measurement of volatility. It's how much a stock has bounced around. Um, that number is a moving target depending on market conditions. If market gets kind of flat, it doesn't move around much, then, then I might be forced to trade stocks that are as low as, let's say, 20 in the HP. Ideally, I want to be trading stocks that are a little bit higher than that, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, when it gets too high, when it gets over triple digits, then in stocks it gets a little too crazy. So I'm not sure what you're talking about by velocity 50 days. I don't use anything with velocity, but I use historical volatility based on a 50-day chart. All right, speaking of charts, let's hop out into the overall market. Let's see what's happening. And then um, 
we will start, we'll go into individual uh, stocks. If you want to know about a stock, you can start asking about it now. Um, my ground rules are ask about one stock at a time, and ideally the stock should be trending. If you're new to these presentations, don't worry about the trending aspect. But if you've been around for a while, I'm going to beat you up if you ask about a stock that is not trending. Also, uh, ask about a stock, hit carriage return. Ask about another stock. You can ask about 100 stocks. Just hit carriage return. If you ask about 10 in one line, I'm going to pick one out of the 10 and delete your question so I can get to everybody else. Okay? All right. First of all, let's take a look at the peas. All right? Not a good day. <laughs> not a good day at all. And like I said, we had a bad day, and then we had a good day. The good day is like, okay, well, we're within three-quarters of a percent from brand-new highs. That's a good thing. So, so far, so good. And then now, obviously, we're having what? A bad day, okay? Now, what's a little concerning here, let me clean my chart up. And you guys probably know this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Resistance, once broken, becomes support, and support once broken becomes resistance. So what does that mean? Well, let me go back to my handy dandy drawing board and see if I could, let me draw it here. It might be easier to draw it in. It's something I read a while back, um, like 20 years ago, in probably Edwards and McGee. Um, it might have been Preen, okay, or Shaw Baca, but read all three of those. All three of those, um, or good as far as good primers on technical analysis. But resistance once, let's say support, once broken becomes resistance, okay? So let's say a market is up here. It traded for quite a while here, okay? Now, if it comes through that, let's, let's do this differently, make it a little easier to understand. Let's do it this way. Let's say a market is in the range, and let's say it's got support down here. Once the support is broken, this is support, okay, because it's perceived as a value zone up in here. Once that's broken, that support becomes resistance, okay? And the reason being because anybody who bought in this range is going to look to get out at break even. So which was one support is now resistance. Now, resistance once broken, okay, becomes support. So this is now a support zone because it's gotten out of that resistance. So support broken becomes resistance, resistance broken becomes support. Let's take a look at the P's and see if what we can glean from that. Okay, so we got a little support right here, and that got taken out. Now, the whole thing I just said about resistance and support means that the prior breakout levels, once it breaks past, see, this is resistance, but once it gets past that resistance, this resistance becomes support, okay? So if we draw a line over here, now it's not exactly perfect, but we could see that this Resistance is now support, and now we're pushing into this support. So ideally, we want to, we want the market to find some support somewhere in this area, and now it's a little bit below it, and now we've taken out the short-term support in here. So we don't want the piece to drop much further than where they are. That would be a possible cause for concern. Okay. Now, what do you do with your open portfolio? Nothing. Let the stops take you out. I guess I'll say, let the stops, and then I'll go say, take you out. How's that? Okay. We need to do a little infomercial one night. That'll be fun. Um, not a good day, one bad day. Sometimes one bad day is one bad day, but let's just see what happens. Okay. Let's just take it one day at a time. Um, but if it does get below this support, then this support has become what? And then you guys holler back, resistance. Very good. You're learning. You make me proud. All right, let's take a look at the NASQAQ. NASQAQ has now officially taken out its little short-term support here. Let me clean up the chart for you. 
So shorter term, it was kind of a couple little lows here. All right. Now we've taken that out, and guess what? That's right around the area, circa 14, uh, I'm sorry, 44.50. It's right around the area of its prior breakout, which that prior resistance is now support, I guess. I guess it never did become a resistance. Yeah, a little bit. So it's broken out, it's rallied up, and now it's come all the way back in to that breakout level. So we're at a bit of an inflection point. If it goes below it, it doesn't mean it's the end of the world. As I often say, it's not like they're flipping a switch or going to flip a switch or going to make it easy on us. But if you start getting stopped out of positions, sometimes your own portfolio is a pretty good microcosm of what's really happening. If you start getting stopped out of positions, then you need to think, wait a minute, maybe I need to back off a little bit and be more selective. And that in and of itself will keep you out of new positions. That plus entries, okay? Dave, what about looking at volatility weekly and on a monthly chart? Well, the only problem with looking at something weekly or monthly is you might be seeing too much of the forest for the trees. Uh, it's a delicate balance in this business. Um, if you're looking at transitional setups, for instance, the bow ties and all, you want to make sure you're looking at those on a daily chart long before you're looking at looking for them on a weekly chart and so forth. Because a, a daily bow tie might be signaling a major top in the market. But if you wait until that weekly bow tie triggers, it may be too late. Now, 2000 and 2003 and 2007, those weekly bow ties were actually very timely signals, especially like in 2000, especially in 2007. The bow tie down, I think, in a weekly towards the end of 2007, long before the 2008 bear market. The bear market bottom of 2002, 2003, it took two years to bottom out, so you had ample time for a weekly bow tie to form. And uh, the subsequent rollover, 2007, as I just said, you had a weekly bow tie. And the weekly bow tie in the 2009 bottom, that was a spike bottom. So that took a long time to materialize. And by the time it materialized, it, was, it certainly wasn't too late. I think the market was going up significantly from then. But it was somewhat late in the cycle because the, the market changed so quick. So my point is those daily charts turned long before. We were getting a bunch of buy setups right around April when the market had bottomed out in March. So we were getting those buy setups pretty darn quickly. Okay, let's take a look at a couple of uh, sectors in here, and then we'll hop right out to the overall market. One thing that I've been seeing quite a bit lately is a lot of areas have gone up and flirted with their old highs and not gotten through them, such as the semis, okay? And, you know, you have to believe in what you see and not what you hope sometimes. You can see that the semis could be bow tying down in here, so that's kind of, a little bit of a concern. Now, some of these areas obviously have already tanked in here, and energies would be a good example of that, okay? You've got the bow tie down. In fact, the second bow tie down. A double top with the bow tie is a very powerful signal. Write that down. If you don't walk away with anything today, then write that down. A bow tie from a double top is a very powerful signal. So, I'm going to venture to say that stick a fork in the energies, the energies are done. Let's take a look at real estate, the REITs, okay? REITs looking pretty ugly, kind of a minor bow tie here. I'm sorry, a minor double top and a bow tie. And it's a top right above this prior type, that top, that second top sometimes. When you get a bow tie, that could be the real deal. And you can see the REITs are imploding. Now, with the REITs imploding, let's take a look at bonds. Bonds kind of imploded in here, and that had me nervous. But now they're working their way back up. So that's good, okay? I want to see rates just, I want to see bonds chop around and rates just stay pretty much stable. Maybe gradually go up a bit or maybe gradually go down a bit. I don't care. I just don't want to see rates make a big quantum leap one way or the other, especially higher because that could, um, could muck things up a little bit. Uh, retail, another one of those areas, kind of pulled back in here, tried to rally a little bit, now kind of failing a little bit. It's not the end of the world in all these areas, okay? If the market turns right back up like it did yesterday, tomorrow, it kind of reminds me of an economist. Economists will tell you tomorrow, while Willie, Willie predicted yesterday didn't come true today. <laughs> Something like that. 
Um, anyway. What's the other thing? Two days from now, tomorrow will be yesterday. Or I forget that one. You can see banks beginning to kind of fail in here. They tried to make it back to new highs. Now they're failing a little bit. You back the chart out a little bit. You see there's some longer-term loss of momentum. So tonight the charts are going to look pretty ugly. Okay, And you'll probably say, wow, uh, Chief Orman really uh, turned negative overnight. And uh, maybe I did. We're doing today. The chemicals tried to break out. Not the end of the world. Coming right back in. But not too far from new highs. Okay. Drugs banged out new highs yesterday, stalling out a little bit in here. As you can see, longer term uptrend intact so far, but possibly losing a little bit of momentum. Let's take a look at like the IBB. The IBB made all time highs yesterday. If I can get it up. Okay. But now it kind of came back in already today. So we're gonna have to watch it. It's it's definitely um definitely beginning to unfold a little bit, uh, almost as I speak. Uh, you know what's amazing is now let's see what we got going on today. We're getting a little bit of a bid in gold today, not much, but a little. Gold's been headed lower in spite of plagues, wars. Uh, what else has happened? Celebrity photos, celebrity dude photos leaked. I, you know, I you got to realize the amount of research that I have to do in this position. It's just it's just grueling sometimes. I had to I had to look up those. Uh, no, I'm joking. I'm half kidding. Um, gold is, the commodity is down towards these multi-year lows. Now, one of these days, we're going to have the mother of all bottoms here. It's going to be one of these days type of situation. We did have a couple of fits and starts in here. We did kind of go after them a couple times, the gold stocks at least, based on the action and the gold stocks and gold uh, in of itself to some extent too. Let's take a look at the gold stocks. You can see gold stocks are actually down here banging out new lows. So do not bottom fish here, okay? Even though they're at multi-year lows, wait for wait for it to bottom out. I think it's Chief Orman. It's Corman? Oh, I hope not. I've been calling him Chief Orman all these years. Orman or Corman? Corman, Orman? <laughs> Somebody looked that up. I thought it was Orman. Um, Honeymoon in Vegas, I think it's a movie. Nicolas Cage. Um, yes, what? Yes, Corman. Yes, Orman. I thought it was Orman. The cable, the cabbie asked him. Corman or Orman? <laughs> Orman. Yeah, it's Orman. Yeah, okay. Not Corman. Orman. All right. I thought it was the wrong one. Wow, Chief Orman really wound up today. You thought Cage said ah? You thought Cage said Corman ah? Oh, I thought you said Cor. I thought you said Orman. <laughs> oh, we better not upset him. Okay. Uh, yeah, it was a good movie, funny movie. All right. Bill says Bill's confusing the issue with facts. Whenever I do that, I go to my favorite website, which helps me resolve that issue. In fact, if you want, we can go there now. Okay. So before we get to Bill's question, which is confusing the issue with facts, let's see if I can do this without re revealing anything uh, proprietary. But Dave, I thought you said you had another proprietary. Okay, how about nothing personal? <laughs> All right, www. Not write this down. Don't confuse F U S E the issue with facts. So whenever something's not making any sense. Go to www. Don't confuse the issue with facts, or you could also go to www. Did not confuse the issue with facts. I'm gonna hit enter, and let's see what answer we get. Ah, we go to DaveLandry.com when we when that happens. So www. Did not confuse the issue with facts, and www. Don't confuse the issue with facts. So Bill saying HCLP and SCLLCA it confused me. Entered HCLP in March, SCLA in June, and profitable. Congratulations. I believe the fundamental story of both sides. Fundamentals? The hell is that? Who let you in here, Bill? <laughs> Fracking demand will continue. Well, we don't want those mother frackers in our hometown, I'll tell you right now, because we have incredible water and from that water we make really good beer so we don't want our beer supply being messed up google a beat of springs okay 
Uh, so we don't want fracking here. So it's not that's fracking here, fracking there, but it's not going to, well, it's fracking there. It's not going to be fracking here. Not on my watch. But fracking demand will drive, continue to drive up price of their product. Okay, that's possible. Okay, that's plausible. I'm about to sell because they have violated my trailing stop. Well, there you go. There's your answer. Okay, three times ATR below recent close. That's plausible too. But interesting how you manage trailing stops in these situations. Well, well, is it remember Reagan? <laughs> well, okay, this is how you manage your stop. Let's say your stop is here and the stock is here. Get out. <laughs> that's a that's a that's a poacher guy stock. Okay? Get out. <laughs> I think it was um what comedian did a, 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 a <laughs> what comedian did a, a white poacher guys versus black poacher guys? <laughs> black poacher guys, get out. Okay, see you. Gotta go. <laughs> black white poacher poacher guys. What's that noise? What's going on? Let's just hang out. <laughs> He's very influential. He lives in a hut. First time in two years, Rot and IWM both had dead cross. What does it mean other than 50 cross the 200 day moving average in a downturn maybe again? Well, okay. People get all excited about the death cross. You know, it's like they need to have some music go dun dun dun. That doesn't mean anything, okay? Uh, let me interview myself. Is it a positive? No, it's a negative, okay? But does it mean anything? No, okay? Um, and the lead and the lag cycles and something like that are just plain old ridiculous, okay? So don't get too caught up in the death cross. And it's called the death cross happens when the 50-day moving average crosses below the 200-day moving average. Now, you've got to realize that there's so much lag in this. Thanks for bringing it up, though. I do, I do see where. Okay, it's kind of cool to uh, to talk about it. So we have a death cross, dun, 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 in the Russell. It doesn't mean anything to me until the Russell takes out these prior lows in here. Okay, look at a chart first and foremost. All right, um, and a market can sell off fairly hard without those moving averages crossing. So if it's selling off really hard. Even if they're not crossing, I think it's worth paying attention to. But uh, don't get too caught up in the fact that the Russell has made a death cross. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so. Oh, man. I need to, maybe I do need to break the pros that I could have, huh? <laughs> well, yeah, it could be a downtrend, but let's not, let's not use this to call the downtrend because – if, if that's the case, then, well, this was the downtrend, okay? And, and no, no, wait, this was the downtrend. And then, no, 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 let's go back in time. So, um, but, yeah, sooner or later, it's going to be right, okay? But you've had quite a few death crosses, dun, 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 over the years. So let's not get too excited about that. But, yeah, it's worth knowing. All right, let's let's uh, let's start talking about some stocks in here. I think we've talked enough about everything else G L and G yeah this looks pretty good I'm not a huge fan of shipping stocks because they tend to chop around more than anything um, you've got a breakout here I mean it's already at 70 bucks a share coming in from uh, from 30 and then prior it might be priced for perfection okay uh, overall market a little iffy energy is not doing too good uh, shipping stocks normally follow energy because most of the shipping is shipping oil around, right? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems that uh, most of the shipping is oil-related. And it takes a lot of oil to ship, I guess. Yeah, you're welcome, Bill. Bill says that's the info he was looking for. When stopped out, get out. What do you do when the price breaks through? You iron a stop that's nothing to do. Okay. Love. Exciting and new. Um 
It's not too bad, but it's had a pretty good run for an airline. It went up 300%. It's an airline. How often do airlines go up that much? You know, I often joke about my airline trading system. You wait until they go up and you short them. It's a horrible business, okay? Not to confuse the issue with facts after my long speech on that. Um, it looks like it might have lost a little tiny bit of shorter term resistance. I think I would leave it alone. The trend is still up. If you're long, use a stop and let it stop you out, okay? But I wouldn't go after a new position here. I mean, if anything, it's kind of like a tiny, tiny, tiny micro first thrust. It would probably be too dangerous to trade, though. I wouldn't run a, rush out and trade it based on that. A knack. Get the knack. That was a good album, wasn't it? Was it Rice Aroni? Was a hit on that? People would have to be in music, into music to make <laughs> to get that. Um, well, yeah, I mean, you've got this nice long trend here, but this is kind of becoming a bit of a Janet Jackson situation. What have you done for me lately? It's kind of going mostly sideways for a while. Um, it really has it. It's like right at its peak, which was way back in August. So it's lost too much momentum. Draw your your, your sideways lines. As I often preach, I did a webinar just yesterday, and uh, I did a little bit of my stock selection stick stick in there, and I talked about how a net net price is a pretty amazing thing. Sometimes just a net net price will keep you out of a new trade. People. People are, and I talked about this in the stock selection course too, but people will see this move from here to here and think, wow, it's up 100% or whatever the case may be, 50% in this case, I guess. I might need to buy this stock, but what they fail to realize is, well, wait a minute, over the last month, you know, what have you done for me lately? Are you shorting Adobe too early? I'm not a big fan of Adobe, but sometimes these big fat stocks like Mew can be a wonderful trade. I don't like this big old gap here, and it's got all this fluff back here. I absolutely love this. Okay, so high five on that. That's beautiful. When I back the chart out a little bit, it's got some issues, and it's probably going to run run into some um, support somewhere around here. So, yeah, the bigger they are, the harder they fall, but I think you could probably find something else, especially given this particular market at this juncture with uh, coming off of high levels. ZTS as a short for Mr. John. John, you're always shorting. John's a shortened, short a lot, I guess. Uh, it's a little too early. I mean, I wouldn't buy it because it's lost steam. It's it's a little too bit of a micro. It's not even a micro first thrust. Um, I hear you, though. It's losing steam, John. Uh, maybe keep it on your radar, and then once you get a, a little bit more bona fide signal, go after it. QRE is a short. Boy, I'm impressed, you guys. Rarely get asked about all these shorts. I don't like them. Again, I don't like the stocks that gap higher and then come back in. And then you've got a mountain. Look at all this trading down here. So what's going to happen? This thing's going to sell off, and then it's going to go to 19 or 19 or 18 or whatever. It's just not enough potential for me. I like a stock. You know, you look at that rad. Eh, I did have a little trading in there. Maybe I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth, but not a whole lot. When it began to break down, to me, it looked like it had a lot further to drop. Okay, then just into the next little bit of resistance. It didn't have a whole lot of support on the way down. Let's take a look at Mew and see. Same thing with Mew. I mean, Mew, your last support's down here in the 20s. It's way up in the 30s. That's a pretty good drop for this stock. I and mean, that's far enough for me to at least get some good profits out of it. And that's why we ended up short that one. Okay. GLW for Mr. Peter. Uh, if you're already short, stay short. But I don't see any setup here uh, to get short. Yeah, I mean it's it's kind of it's already cracked and then went back up. I bet it's a I bet it went up to kiss that 50-day goodbye. Let's just for S and G's take a look at that. Yeah, it kind of went up, kind of gapped down, went up, kind of crawled up to the 50, and then kind of rolled over. It's kind of a bigger picture pattern of things, but it, it sometimes it's kind of interesting. But I'd pass. It's not one of my patterns that I directly trade. 
Cross out IDSY. Okay, good for you. All right, Andre asked the stock, and then he crossed it out. Good for you. My, my work is done. Uh, VIMC. VIMC. Um, it's a little too much of a bottle rocket for me, okay? Uh, yeah, I like momentum. Don't get me wrong. Uh, HV, almost triple digit. It went up 300%. Now it's pulling back a little bit. Um, I mean, it looks good if you don't if you don't measure the scale, okay? Without looking at the scale of a 300% move, it looks like a pretty good move. Also, I'll tell you what I like about it, forgetting the scale for a minute, I like the fact that your bars began to widen up, meaning that that trend is accelerating, okay? And then in that acceleration of the trend, you can see now it's begun to pull back. So it looks pretty good. But the reason I wouldn't go after it, unless we were in a crazy, crazy, crazy rip-roaring bull market, which we're not, but the reason I wouldn't go after it is because it's already ran up 300% over a short period of time. Just too dangerous to trade. Or why I would you add on a pullback or – is that a home builder? Oops. Or why I – oh, I don't know what that is. Uh, well, it's super thin, so I'd be careful on that. Uh, yeah, maybe on a pullback it'd be okay. I mean, that's only a 30% run for an IPO. It's not that huge of a deal for an IPO, at least. Maybe on a pullback. So let's give that one a maybe. APA as a short, I'm going to probably give you an okay on that one. But let's let's take a look at the chart first. And the only reason I'm saying that is because APA is a... Keep getting that moving average in there. App is an energy stock. Well, it's not set up. So I'm going to say no. It's not set up. It is rolling over. You got all this trading back in here over the years. Um, I think if you went to the energies, you could find, like we just had WLL was on the Landry list, okay? And it wasn't an official setup, but it was on the Landry list as a short. You did have a little bit of a gap here, but it came in and pretty much closed that gap. And you can see that it's coming off of all-time highs, so it's a little bit different situation as opposed to something that's kind of at mid to low level. So this is what you want to look for in your shorts as far as things I like in those emerging trends. John wants to know about OTIC. OTIC. Now this one actually triggered back here. I think we're. I think this one's in the port, the IPO portfolio. Um, but yeah, so far so good on a pullback, uh, real thin, so be careful. But as I say, as a private trader, you can go in and, and trade these IPOs and, and take a chance. MSON, MSON. Uh, that's too thin, Andre. Is that one you scratched out for being too thin? Um, I hear you, but boy, is that thin. Uh, that's like way, 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 way too thin. Okay. VIMC, you like those micro caps, don't you? Yeah, we talked about that one. Okay, um, why? Jonathan wants to know about why. Uh, it looks like it's in trouble. It's too thin. You can't short this. It's too thin to short. 40,000 on average volume, not much. Um, HV of 8, no, it just doesn't bounce around. It doesn't move around enough. I would leave that alone. You meant to add another Y to that, didn't you? John, I can't talk about that one. That's today's setup. Good good, uh, good call there, buddy. NVTL, Novotel. Novotel. Um, yeah, maybe a little bit more. It needs a little pullback. Nah, it's too wide and loose. It's all over the place longer term. I mean, if you would just, again, let's just kind of look at the the microcosm here, maybe on a pullback, you could see you've got acceleration of trends. So you've got a good eye there, John, I have to admit. Uh, but maybe on a pullback, but longer term, I don't like the action, so I would pass on that. Short setup for on the service tonight for tomorrow. Um, that's a tough one, Robert, because what ha he, Robert is asking him if I have some shorts on for tomorrow. And that might be tough because here's the, here's the problem. Um, when you have... 
the, the methodology requires a pullback, okay? So let's say, let's say the market, oops. Okay, let's say you're looking at a stock that looks like this, okay? Well, the methodology requires a pullback, so let's say the market's doing this, okay? Well, what's going to happen to this stock you're watching? It's going to go, it's going to do that. The market would actually have to go up, so this would begin to pull back to create shorts. So I can't answer that question right now until I do my analysis, okay? Yeah, so you will need, yeah, exactly, Robert. Uh, you will have to wait for a pullback after a big drop, okay? AAVL, would you buy? I don't know. Is it trending? I could do a good bunch today as far as uh, no uh, no non-trending stocks just yet, huh? Pretty good. Uh, no, see, this one, this one is now under the guise of the core methodology, okay? So what's going to have to happen now under the guise of the core methodology would mean that it would have to, that's all I'm saying there, is it would have to make new highs and then have to pull back. It broke out, but then it kind of came back in, so it has lost some short-term momentum. Um, as I discussed in the IPO course, yes, IPOs do have a breakout characteristic to them, and if you are going to trade breakouts, you're going to do far more better trading IPOs than you will do trading uh, stocks in general because most breakouts tend to fail, although there are some breakout characteristics in IPOs that are worth trading. But with this one now, it's been out a couple of months. Uh, I would just treat it more like I would I would take it from the IPO column and put it more in your it, – it's what I call a toddler. A toddler is an, a, a, a new IPO, but it still has potential, but it's not as, ex as exciting as it originally was as an IPO. Okay, There's a first initial euphoria – that gives a lot of these things some pops, okay? IDSY. IDSY. Ooh, another thin one. Boy, you're really going after those thin ones there, Andre. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, it broke out. Maybe on a pullback. Um, yeah, let it pull back a little bit. But then again, way, 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 way too thin. And that becomes very dangerous. Uh, 36,000, is that much? Uh, on average volume, that's not much. Cosi? What does Cosi mean? Thing in, uh, in Italian, right? That's a restaurant. It's a new issue and a restaurant. Um, no, not a new issue. Uh, not bad. A little bit on the thin side, given the price. Not bad, but kind of, um, you can see how it's kind of crazy based on the on, it's like from here, what is this, from here to here? Oh, that's the bad. Uh, like this wide range bar here, it's uh, a 180, 260, what's 260 minus 180? 260 minus 180, that's 80 divided by, what's that, um, 180? I mean, that's a 44% bar. One bar in this stock is 44%. So that's just too volatile. Uh, cozy means dog in stock. <laughs> cozy. Colsa. Colsa is what I'm thinking of. Colsa. Colsa is something. Um. I see what you're saying. It's kind of cup and handle-ish. But if it's going to move 50% in one day, man, that's hard to trade. That's really hard to trade. Jonathan, you funny guy. E-M-K-R. We probably need to go ahead and wrap things up soon. Uh, no, too much of a big gap in here. And once they have a huge gap like that, I ignore them, okay? All right, let's, um, let's see if we can shed some light on Illumina. Looking to short. Okay, uh, we'll wrap it up on this one. Uh, it's breaking down. Maybe, maybe it could set up. Um, I think with biotech, if you take a look at like the IBB, with biotech doing this, 
you might be able to find something a tiny bit cleaner, something off of brand new highs breaking down. Uh, I hear you though; it looks like it's in trouble, but I think you can probably find something off all-time highs that's a little bit cleaner. Okay, we're uh, we're past time here, so I need to go ahead and, and wrap things up. Repeat your profound statement about a plan with a failure clause messes up the brain. Uh, my point was that when you plan a trade, you have to put a stop in. You have to you have to say where am I going to be wrong, okay? And you have to say, all right, well I'm going to be wrong at whatever that number is. Let's just say fifteen, okay? It's a stock in the eighteen dollar range, volatile, whatever. If it goes to 15, I got to get out. So you write down 15. So the second you write down 15 in your plan and actually have a physical plan. Now, once you get a little further down the road, you won't, you don't have to plan out every, I mean, you have to plan it out, but you don't have to write down everything or whatever, just have it in a spreadsheet or whatever uh, and knowing where you're going to get out, like I just showed you in the service spreadsheet. So have, do have a stop somewhere. But in the early phases, you know, handwrite that plan out. And in handwriting it out, it forces you to think about it. And it also, there's something tactile about actually feeling it. See it, feel it, touch it, whatever. The, you know, get all your senses involved. But when you put that, actually, that sounds a little spacey, but it may, it'll make sense to you. Um, because the more senses you can get involved, the more it becomes real. But the second you put down that stop at 15, is the second you admit that you might be wrong. And most people don't want to admit that they could be wrong. Okay? So that's the point I was trying to make on that. Okay? All right, look, we better wrap things up. I love these shows. As you know, it's a highlight of my week. I, I just think it's a – I just have a blast doing them. Thanks for showing up. Uh, thanks for listening to me. I appreciate it. Uh, any unanswered questions, DavidDaveLander.com. I'm pretty much swamped now, so it may take me a while to get back to you. Obviously, if you're on the service, you have precedence. Precedents. I'll give you precedent. Precedents. I think that's a word. But uh, everybody have a great weekend. We don't talk again. And uh, see all you guys next week. Thank you so much.